Hey, welcome to the Cam and Oda Show. This week, uh, Ashi Mittal joining us from uh, Ohio. Yeah, <laughs> I had to think about that for a minute. I knew it was somewhere, one of them states out in the Midwest, you know, that if you're a Texas boy, I don't think about a whole lot, I'll be honest with you. But you know what? She's an important person, which makes Ohio an important place for us, <laughs> at least for the next hour or so while we're talking to her. Ashi, <laughs> great to have you on the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's always great to spend a couple extra minutes with Otis and Camden and their cute little jokes, right? <laughs> yeah, my bad dad jokes always come through. You know that. <laughs> hey, I want to, I, I just want to jump on something. Uh, when did you shift to say, all right, I, I just want to do stuff on my own, kind of that entrepreneur, take on the entrepreneur mindset? When, when did that happen? Oh my gosh, I've always had it, Otis. It's really mm. strange. I've always known that I wanted to own my own business. I didn't know what that was, but I always knew that I wanted to make an impact, do things independently. And it was really weird. I remember when I was five years old, my father is a retired university professor, and I would just follow him around on campus all day when you know I wasn't in school or wasn't uh, home. And I remember somebody asked me, they said, okay, what do you want to do? At five years old, somebody was asking me this. And I said, I remember two things. One, I said, I want to get a PhD like my dad. So that is forthcoming. And number two was, I don't want to work for anyone. And I remember this man, and by the way, he eventually became the university president you know, about a decade and a half later, and he knew who I was. Uh, and he said, That's, How's that, that can be going? good and bad, right? <laughs> oh, it can be an absolutely terrifying thing when everybody knows you. <laughs> Getting um, the nicknames, one of which I will never reveal, mm, however, mm -hmm. because you're special to me, Otis. I will tell you, I got the name UC Baby when I was like five years old, and I was going back for graduate school, one of the top programs in the world. And I would think, I would have hoped that everybody would have been retired, would have forgotten about, no, that was not the, the case, it doesn't tenure. help, <laughs> right, right, and then of course <laughs> people have accelerated to the top of the food chain, so we're talking about, you know, the people from the provost office, the university president, you know, he invited me to his office so we could catch up, and he said, so hey, you see baby, how's everything going, and I just <laughs> wanted to crawl under his coffee table and die, it was, um, it was really intriguing. And then he was like, so how's that going? Is that still happening? They said, yes, it is. It is absolutely still happening. So uh, always had it. It's, I think once you get bit by the bug, it doesn't leave you, right? Mm -hmm. So when you were growing up, like, like you said, always having an entrepreneurial mindset, were you like, because a lot of folks we have on here, they had the lemonade stands. Ooh, it's a hard word in this morning, apparently. <laughs> uh, were you anything like that to where you knew you wanted to do it and you were actually doing something or was it more so just uh, you understood that that was a goal that you had later in life? So I feel like I was a serial entrepreneur. Uh, you know, most kids, <laughs> my father's going to love this. Uh, you know, in the summer, they have a lemonade stand. They have one lemonade stand. So this is what I ended up doing. I ended up franchising a series of lemonade stands in my, uh, <laughs> not only my neighborhood and in the subdivision, but through multiple subdivisions where I would say, hey, look, Go ahead and set up this lemonade stand. You can make the lemonade any way you want to. This is what we're charging. And for use of the permission of the name and to run a lemonade stand, I think that I was about eight when this happened. <laughs> I'll charge you a nice little uh, quarter fee. So I um, made a lot of money that summer and most of it went into my savings account. Not my choice. It was my mother's choice that one um but yeah no I always always doing things of that nature but it's just that when I got through most of my college career at least my bachelor's degree I was sitting there thinking look I'm about to enter this intensive program where it was third in the world it still is at this point through the University of Cincinnati for archaeology and Egyptology and I got the opportunity to meet with people who you would not normally be able to associate even 10 years postdoc, depending on how good you were. And people have this connotation that you've got to be crazy to go into those fields. And I'm not going to lie. You've got to be the best of the best if you're going to be successful in a field like that. And I was working with the top 1% of people in the world. And I started noticing issues. So you're seeing you're having a conversation with someone who's running one of the top archaeological museums in the world. 
and you're sitting there noticing gaps in their strategic planning or the way they're approaching their funders. And, and you were what, 20-something 20, 20 at that point? I yeah, mean, at that point, this, 20, 21, 22. Yeah, this, this, <laughs> this young, young. snapper coming, coming what, behind me. the ears, right? Yeah, 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 no. And it just, it was very eye-opening. And then I think it was within maybe five minutes, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to be there to help organizations around the world not only have that proper foundation, but to grow and stick around for more than five minutes, right? So that's kind of how that came to be, where I had that focus. And I had that really weird route up the mountain. I started in the international spotlight and in the international dynamic and worked my way backwards. Whereas most people are trying to breach and get into the space on that world stage. So very bizarre case. Well, you know, I'm a, I, I grew up as a national geographic boy, you know, uh, had those in the house all the time. So anytime you start talking about those digs that you went on and things you did, uh, the Egyptology, I'm just like, Oh, that's so cool. Cause I can, I've been just visualizing the, the National Geographic uh, magazines, flipping through those as a kid. Uh, what, what, was the, what was the best thing about that when you went on those, those uh, I, I guess they were digs. Is that, is that how you? Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. Kind of sound all fancy. Yeah, no, that's exactly what it was. I spent uh, about 27 digs out in the Mediterranean. So obviously Egypt would be known as Iran, Iraq today, former Persia, a lot of work in Athens and the Athenian Agora, but Egypt, a great amount of time. Abu Simbel, one of my favorites, discovering one of the secret rooms under the Sphinx. Um, wonderful experience. I mean, you can't put a price tag on those experiences. I just want to write a book on those few years alone. Um, mm -hmm. It was, uh, there are no words. It was amazing. It was absolutely magical because you're sitting here and you're learning these languages. You're learning how to translate things that many people would be like, why are you wasting your time learning how to translate hieroglyphics? Well, for me, it was important to be able <laughs> to do that, right? Uh, understanding ancient Greek, Latin, things of that nature. Um, and to really put all of your training into play. And the beautiful part about this program is it wasn't like you were studying for a year and a half and then you go on one experience. No, you were uh, involved in your first experience within about two and a half months in the door, close to three. Oh, wow. So yeah, you were preparing a great deal. And just to see it come to fruition and you read about these things and you hear about these things and people are always telling you about these experiences and nothing matches up to actually being there. Not to mention, I like to get a little dirty. I'm dressed up very pristine these days and when I'm in my stateside outfits, right? But to be able to get out there and go play in the dirt as my husband likes to call it, um, such a good time. What do you think was the best lesson that you apply now or skill that you learned during that time that you kind of use on a maybe everyday basis? Oh goodness, tenacity. Absolutely. I was already naturally tenacious, but you know, you're sitting out there filling how many buckets of dirt and getting them out of the ground for how many days, right? It's not like how it is in the movies. I'm sorry to disappoint, ladies and gentlemen. It's not I mean, like- it's not you, Raiders of the Lost Ark where you're grabbing the globe and shifting it. Right, exactly. You know, um, people laugh because I do have the Indiana Jones thing going on. But uh, honestly, it's not like you get out one bucket of dirt and then all of a sudden, oh my gosh, record-breaking news. We found so-and-so. No, that's that's- that's not how this works. So you have to really be patient, but you also have to be proactive, right? Um, you, you know, it's what I like to call my clients. You know, there are days where you just want to kick back, relax, and pretend nothing exists. You've had the worst day of you think your life. And you have to figure out how to turn that into something positive. What have you learned, right? Or what could you do better next time? Or even how can you salvage the situation? There's so many times where you think a deal is completely off the table. You have to figure out what it is that you're missing. How can you spin it around? But if you are willing to quit after the first test of resistance, this life is not for you, you have to be able to deal with the ups and downs in a healthy way and keep moving forward, for sure. That's a that's a great segue because I want. So you went from digging to this corporate leadership development and strategy development. I think 
that's a you know that, that that's kind of almost left brain right brain sort of stuff or at least left stage right stage <laughs> and nothing else i mean <laughs> those are those are hybrid separate. yeah yeah Definitely so very hybrid so how, how did you make that leap i mean that's a that's a really i mean it, it is it's quite a leap well, as I got more experience under my belt, I decided, you know what, there were other projects that I was doing. As you guys know, I'm an author, best-selling author. I wrote my first book at the age of 18. It was published. Uh, and by that time, I had a couple more under my belt. And I was like, look, I've got a lot of experience. And people who are experts in these lanes, not just, of course, in archaeology and history, but people who run, you know, at that point, Verge, unicorn businesses, people who are running things on a world stage as well as, you know, obviously on a national stage, they were saying to me, Ashi, what are you doing? Are you serious? Like, are you going to go work for someone where you're going to go plateau? We're not saying you can't make it up that corporate ladder, but have you thought about doing this on your own? You've got more experience than many people coming out with a doctorate have. What what are you thinking? What are you doing? You're great. You're good at this problem solving thing. You should consider that. And all I did was just take the leap of faith that gave my parents a heart attack, which was becoming a consultant. I didn't have my firm up and running, but I was doing things on an independent scale. And you know, the funny thing is, you know, my mom, she's a woman who does not like the C word, change. She does not like change. She does not fare with change well. She's a very successful physician. She came to this country with nothing but a medical degree, passed one of the hardest tests on the face of the planet to get your medical license to practice here in the United States. And then she started with nothing. And now she owns an extremely successful practice. She's involved with, uh, you know, healthcare administration, politics. I mean, she's amazing. So she was a source of inspiration. But my dad, he was one of those really neat professors who not only did the teaching thing, but he also did the consultant thing. So he was mm -hmm. working with foreign governments, places like SpaceX. I mean, his students, his former students are in the weirdest places that you could ever <laughs> imagine. And I remember when I told him about this game plan, he said to me, are you sure you want to do this as, you know, a practicing consultant mm -hmm. in engineering? Are you sure you know what you're getting yourself into? And, you know, I'm his kid. So, of course, he's, you know, worried about what I'm going to be doing and said, yeah. And I had luckily connections. I was prepared. It wasn't like, okay, so tomorrow I'm going to become an independent consultant. I'm going to start looking for things. I was definitely preparing to make sure that I had clients from the get-go and was taking the bull by the horns, right? No paralysis of fear. Yeah, I think it's definitely, uh, when you're trying to make that leap of faith, it's a lot easier if you actually have stuff established like that. I think that's, you know, like you talk about a lot of different entrepreneurial classes and things I've been in, uh, coaching and things. You talk about how you want to have uh, the demand-based business model, not the supply-based business model, because the demand-based one means that you can sell when you get started. And that's really what you're doing there on the consultant side of things. If you actually bring someone in and you have those things ready to go, it makes that leap a whole lot easier than just having some brand new idea and trying to get it started out there. No, absolutely. I, you know, I coach a lot of young professionals, right, uh, across the board, whether they're entrepreneurs or they just want some clarity, bottom line coaching, things of like the nature of, okay, so this is what I want to do. How do I get there? I need some guidance. I need some direction. And with the entrepreneurs, young, you know, when they're exploring that space and we have this exercise where I just essentially walk them through that discernment and that determination process of, do you want this? Or are you just thinking, oh yeah, that'd be really cool and it's neat to think about, but I don't want to do that. I'm happy with what I'm doing. I'm making the impact I want to make. So we have that process, but I will say, and pardon me if I climb on this soapbox here, it's just really fascinating when we talk about these expectations, right? I mean, I just had a client a couple weeks ago and Otis, you and I were talking about this during our last conversation where I've got a you know, a client right now who's got a tech startup and they're, they're going to do very, very well, but I've got to get them to slow down for about 32 seconds and ensure that they understand, Hey, look, this can go really well for you. If you take the time to build the infrastructure and then we 
go into, you know, Warp Factor 10, Mr. Zulu will be great. Or you can do that now and just watch it just blow up in your face. It's up to you. And he's talking about keeping up with this competitor. And what he wants to do is take over this competitor's business, mm -hmm. take away their clients, be able to offer what they do so much better. And he thinks it's going to happen when we first had a conversation he thought it was going to happen inside the course of three months. And he kept showing me several examples. And I told him, hey, look, it's really funny that you brought this person up because I was part of the project that led to this. Why don't I get the CEO on the phone with you? First of all, he was absolutely stunned that I could get this person on the phone. I was texting him as he and I were having our mm -hmm. client meeting. And then he joined on Zoom because I simply asked him to. So he was flabbergasted and he had so many amazing questions. But second of all, it really took him a minute to understand that it took about a year to prepare for that execution of one week where they were able to solicit 98% of that competitor's client base. So expectations when you're becoming an entrepreneur, are you going to be turning wealthy overnight? I don't know, Otis, maybe you should answer that one. Um, I'm or, still sleeping. I'm waiting. I'm waiting to wake up for that wealthiness to happen. <laughs> right. I think um, there's a little misconception about the workload, but honestly, um, the expectations have to be there, Camden, as you said. I mean, let's have realistic expectations to get you to where you want to be. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting area when you talk about the expectations, because they can come from so many different places, whether it's you expecting to get rich overnight or expecting people to like your product or whatever it is. There's so many different expectations that go into it as an entrepreneur. The story that I wanted to tell that reminded me of was when I was working with uh, Cobra Valley Indoor Farms up in Miami and Globe area. Uh, nonprofit up there doing indoor agriculture. And I remember I wrote a business plan. I was making a pitch to the board and we had open board meetings because we were nonprofits. We had lots of people there. And I made a pitch about trying to get to, I think it was 50% of the market for, you know, this like 2000 people getting a thousand of them as our customers over the next two years or something like that, growing these different crops. And somebody goes, well, why only 50%? I said, because there's a fries down the street. There's a Walmart down the street. Like, what do you think I'm doing here? We can't just, there's no six month turnaround to steal Walmart's customers. That's not how this is going to work. This is a slow and steady game we're playing here. And you just have to be able to hash those expectations down to realistically, what are you looking at there? Yeah, it's a marathon. We have sprints, but it is a marathon, boys and girls. Make sure you have your running shoes laced up and you've got plenty of electrolytes and water, right? Oh yeah, and sometimes the, well, I'd say that's the hardest part about it, from my opinion at least, is you finish that week long sprint and then you have to start the marathon the next day. And that's where it's really hard, I think is where people struggle. Cause you do get these really exciting weeks. You know, I'm in the middle of one right now where I'm doing a lot of stuff. That doesn't mean that I get to chill out on Saturday or on Sunday or anything. No, it starts over again until you reach another sprint. That's right. right. Where, where are the yachts and the uh, sitting on the beach, you know, that that uh, that you see on all the social media and things like that. Right. Where, where's all that stuff? Uh, Wait on that ocean from property here in Arizona. Right. <laughs> yep. yep. Uh, you, you got you got to put some some digging in to uh, get to that point. There, there's no doubt about it. And, and, you know, one of the things that I was looking back through uh, some of your books and and everybody knows me, I don't read that much. So I didn't, I can't say I read your book, but I did look at some highlights of your book, one of your books and, and oh something to jump. <laughs> I, I'm, you know me, I'm totally honest, but I, I'm <laughs> just curious. The one of the things that, I, that I'm really curious about is, is worker productivity. Cause I'm, I'm hearing it in your coaching and I'm curious, you know, are, are, how do you, how do you measure worker productivity? Oh my gosh, let me count the ways. I, first of all, it is, you're an executive coach as well, so you know this. It's definitely different depending on each occasion. Um, and it goes back to what we're dealing in. But in general, if we're talking about individual basis, and this is so funny that, uh, that we're talking about this, it, because it just reminds me of some things that are going on. And during my exciting week, as your point, Camden, this week, where we're talking about how in the world are you supposed to take care of yourself? You know, we're talking about those expectations jumping from week to week. And it goes back to wellness. I know there are a lot of buzzwords coming out of my mouth here, <laughs> self-care, self-love, et cetera. But I mean, it goes back to what I like to call the triumvirate. So you've got 
the overall ecumenical being, you've got the mental health and you've got the physical health. Uh, it's a combination of all three. You know, there's a podcast that I listen to pretty regularly, excuse me, regularly. It's called Pretty Big Deal. And it's a great podcast for uh, women entrepreneurs. I quote some of the stuff that comes out somewhat regularly to my current clients as well as for myself. And it goes back to routines. I mean, think about it. when we go on a vacation, we get turned down service, right? We <laughs> sit there and we have the amazing blinds closed, the bed turned down, a million pounds of chocolate mints that we know we shouldn't be eating put on the pillow that gives us a stomach ache oh, about five minutes those later. Those help you sleep. That's yeah. what I those, 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 Okay, it's great, great, great medicine. I'll pass it along to my mother, the doctor. <laughs> Eat one pound of chocolate mints every night and it'll be great. Um, and when we get home, we don't do that. It doesn't translate, does it? So what should you be doing for yourself for your evening routine that helps you calm your anxieties, where you stop working? What is it? Aromatherapy, taking a bath, reading, having great conversation. What is it? So it's applying those routines, just like we hear about the concept of making those lists. Is it the night before, the morning of? you know, and really planning your day. Every single person is different. I've got one client who's extremely regimented. They are a former Navy SEAL and he loves the fact that we went ahead and put together his day. So every single day, Monday through Sunday, he's got a regiment that's worked out. I mean, every single minute is accounted for. And then I've got another client who happens to be CEO of you know, a multinational company, and he can't do that. Every single day, as we know, brush fires come up, things come up. And he said, look, I just want to be able to get my productivity up. How can I do that? And I said, well, what makes you motivated? What works for you? How tired do you get? And we ended up working out something that was tremendous and been incredibly successful to him because he was able to have what I like to call a boss time, me time where he does not do anything involving the business for various time segments throughout the day, whether it's sometimes it's 20 minutes, sometimes it's five minutes where it's just me time. Sometimes he's out there rollerblading. Yes, I did say that. He goes out rollerblading. Other times he is playing his flute. Sometimes he's literally doing meditation. And then he does what we like to call deep work or practical work time. And it's something that Bill Gates does. It's something that Steve Jobs did. It's something that I apply where you go in and do what you need to do to get the job done. No distractions, no eating, no phone calls, no drinking. It's you and getting those tasks done within 20 to 25 minutes. So the overall arching point to answer your question, Otis, is you've got to think about what works for you, okay? Because what works for Camden, may not work for me. What works for me may not work for you, Otis. So really think about what you need to get the work done, whether it's the environment, the physical environment in which you're at, you know, you don't want to be playing with your dogs or your cats. Is it uh, perhaps too much caffeine or not enough caffeine? And also really get up and move, guys. Circulate that blood. I mean, mm -hmm. especially during quarantine and sheltering in place and you've got to get up. You've got to at the very least get up and walk around for 30 minutes go out take a walk walk around your home do what you got to do to get the blood and the thoughts going that's yeah, your always your soapbox then <laughs> yeah, well that's what i was just going to say I, you know uh tony robbins i don't remember where which time i heard him say this but it's one of the things he says all the time is motion creates emotion and you know it, it's it's that old thing you get the blood flowing there's more oxygen in your system. There's more oxygen in your system. There's more oxygen in your brain. You can yeah. think more. You can do more. You have more clarity. So, yeah, no, that, that's awesome. And you're right. Everybody has a little bit different thing, whether it's you don't do 20 push-ups or, you know, rollerblading. I mean, it sounds like quite the Renaissance man. Flute, rollerblade, those sort of things. <laughs> All right. Uh, you know, it, it's just it's an amazing thing how we can we can tweak those sort of things and come up with it. One of the things I, I, I'm curious about is what, what's your go-to? When somebody says, somebody says, hey, I see, lady, I am just all over the map. Where do I start? You know, kind of that, 
here, you know, the, the here's my bucket of crap. Help me. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. So that's usually where we start off. Uh, it goes back to, you know, seeing what's a distraction, what's a pleasure, what is it that you really want to focus on. And it's what I like to call the mental clutter, right? Uh, you know, figuring out what's important to the individual. And we've got a little thing that I like to call the streetlight system. Okay, so, and you've heard about this, Otis, as he nods his head, he's like, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, so essentially, you've got three categories. You've got your greens, your yellows, and your reds. And we go through this process where I walk them through, hey, okay, in terms of where you are in life and where you want to be, or where you are in your business and where you want your business to be, what are the non-negotiables, aka the mandates, things that you absolutely want to have, aka those fit in the green column, things that you absolutely don't want to deal with, which are in the red column, and then things that are your negotiables where you can say, oh, you know, it's not a deal breaker. I can fit this in, or it's not that much of a high priority, but it's there in the yellow column. So we first go through that process where, you know, it's like, what are we spending our time on? Is it a hobby? Is it something you want to turn into your full-time gig in some cases, other times for your business, for the growth, you know, of your brand? For instance, I've got a young lady out in Denver who has her own cosmetics startup and it's going really well and she's ready to elevate to that next level. And we just had a conversation yesterday. She said, Ashi, uh, you know, I need some guidance. Tell me you know, how to work with these things, you know, the supply chain and the engineering side of things, my manufacturers, but also tell me what I'm supposed to be doing with COVID and these product launches. You know, a lot of things are changing. You know, you don't hold on to the certainty. You look for clarity. And I said, okay, let's start with what's that top priority. What is the priority to you? And I also want to say every single day you will have priorities. It's a matter of determining which priorities need to be taken care of that day. Right. So that's first and foremost, but let's see what's important to you. What is it that you want to focus on? Once again, bring in the productivity factors. How do we keep your energy up? You know, for some people, they noticed that when they stopped eating unhealthier foods, they noticed a major improvement in their energy when they started mm -hmm. incorporating more of the vegetables and fruits and, you know, pre-prepped food plans in some cases, you know, HelloFresh even. One client of mine is starting a business relationship with HelloFresh and it started from the fact that I recommended that he gets it shipped to his home. So that's something, right? Uh, but it really goes back to be open-minded, be ready for change. Change is not always a bad thing, but empower yourselves, right? Get, you know, be comfortable, but be confident. Mm -hmm. And once again, you've got to determine what's important to you. What is it that you want to do every single day? Well, you have every single day, right? So one thing that I feel like we, we touched on earlier, and then you just kind of mentioned it again, I think it'd be an interesting area to talk about because it's very topical, is we're talking about worker productivity. And one of the main things you mentioned, Ashi, is the routine side of things, which I think a lot of people can relate to right now, because as we're going through the pandemic and a lot of people are shifting to working from home, you're seeing that a lot of people can be really productive working from home and a lot of people aren't. Because for some people, you need that office structure where you have to be there, you know, eight to five every day, otherwise you're not going to get anything done. Or you're the person who can, you know, mop the floors while you get two business calls done or whatever it is. And so some people are way more productive now and some people are less. But I mean, I, I would love to hear what y'all think about this. But in my opinion, that goes back to what we were saying, which is just knowing yourself, knowing what you need to be productive. And if you're a person who needs to clean the house every morning so that you can work, otherwise you'll spend the rest of the day cleaning the house or it'll distract you the rest of the day, then you figure out what kind of system will work for you. Or if it's walking your dog every hour or whatever type of thing you need, it's about knowing yourself and trying to create a system, a routine out of that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, will say that scheduling and having some form of structure does make a difference because I am coming into this wonderful podcast from my office this morning in my own home. And I will say it was really bizarre because two weeks before the United States shut down due to this pandemic, I was picking out 
paint swatches and carpet swatches for an office in Seoul, South Korea, right? Uh, we had an office in Brussels that was doing great. <laughs> you know, we had an office in uh, the Northeast United States and we were doing tremendously well. And then we thought about how things were going. Our teams were working just around the clock. It was business as usual. I hate to use that term, but it really was and has been some business as usual in terms of the productivity, in terms of the effective communication, in terms of the team doing what we needed to do to make sure our clients were making it through this, not only just surviving, but being successful and thriving as well. And somewhere around June, I believe it was the end of May, June 1st, I pulled the plug. I shut down my offices in Brussels, in Boston, in San Francisco, in Ohio, and we did temporarily cease what was going on in Seoul because everybody was capable of doing what we needed to do. And if we needed physical space, we could get it. And one thing I did notice with some of my strategic partners and some people who I was doing work with, when they lost that sense of structure, they somewhat lost themselves. I remember I had to uh, give a nice talking to, to one of my individuals out there in Europe where he uh, went on vacation. That's great. Do what you got to do. Go where you need to go. Uh, enjoy yourself, recharge. He came back and it was like he left himself somewhere on that journey mentally. He was gone. He was literally watching Hulu, Netflix, YouTube for six or seven hours for a few days. Projects weren't getting done. He just kept pushing it back. And I'm like, look, I'm not going to micromanage. You're a really talented person. I've worked with you before. You get the job done. Deadlines are met. Clients are taken care of. But when we got close to a deadline and he fell behind and there was no way he was going to accomplish work and I had to pull off a few other people from another project just to help him out to make up for lost time. Yeah, that didn't go over so well. So I just have been sitting here thinking about what you've been saying and it goes back to structure, but I found that with other businesses, for instance, uh, during early on the pandemic, as they were transferring themselves and transitioning to remote work, there was a communications problem, a big one. Either <laughs> these companies were communicating way too much, where I was being told, why are we having a meeting about this? Even when we were at the office, we never had meetings about this. There was an email, something offline. Why are we talking about this now? Or there was a disappearance of leadership and presence altogether where people who have a routine or they know what the purview of their job is, all of a sudden they're taking on things that management should have been handling. They're like, why in goodness gracious his name am I having to handle this? I'm not trained to handle this. Where is our leadership? And leadership was scrambling just to make sure everybody's needs were met. Technology at home, making sure people weren't getting fired or laid off or furloughed and things of that nature. So it's been a curious mix. I guess my question to the two of you is, do you think this remote work thing is here to stay? For a lot of folks, yes. Because I think for a lot of people, they're going to be way more productive at home. And then I think you add in all of the, because of course it depends, but I think you add in all the other business factors of as an owner or as a manager looking at, okay, do I need this office space? You know, how often do I actually need people in here? Can we share, you know, can we have one big office room and we just cycle people through for the two hours that you actually need to be in here and the rest you can do from home? I think, I don't know, I, I'm pretty confident I think it's here to stay because, and the other big factor for it, I think, is that the, the pandemic has pushed the technological jump uh, right up to now. That, that I think there was a lot of things that were borderline ready to go as far as technology, you know, even just getting on Zoom calls and those types of things that were pretty darn good, but weren't quite ready to make the everyone using it all the time jump. And they had to make that jump. And I think that things are going to come out better and it's just going to keep getting better and people will adjust to it. And, so yeah, I, I think for most people, this is something that'll be around for quite a bit. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I said that, you know, probably five, five months ago. We probably ago said this that, in our co first COVID episode, didn't we? Yeah, right. yeah, I mean, no one, hey, no one's if you're investing in commercial real estate, get out. I mean. <laughs> yeah, right. Now is not the time. No, the only thing, for sure. The only thing I, I would say, the business that's going to 
going to still go, and I think it's going to, and Camden kind of talked to this, is, is those uh, kind of like a WeWork or the Regis office where, where I've got a retainer and I can get a conference room to have an in-person meeting once a month or whatever, because that's a heck of a lot cheaper. Now, I, I've got some clients that, are, that have put everybody out and production is going great. But they're they're kind of old school and they're like, oh, we got to get everybody back in. And, and they're, they're really having a hard time, you know, and they're actually paying extra money for the extra cleaning, and the, the plexiglass separate, all those crazy things. And it's like, hey, ROI, dude, you know, is it really is it really worth it? You know, <laughs> so uh, I think there's some businesses that are going to force themselves back into the what they were doing in February. I think the the innovators, those businesses that are going to excel and succeed and, and have been, they're going to figure out how to continue to do this all remote. Mm -hmm. the heck of yeah, a lot Google's of Google's doing that. A friend of mine who's uh, running for the U.S. House of Representatives, her oldest daughter joined uh, the workforce at Google about a year ago, and as you guys know, they have gone uh, obviously remote through 2021. They're thinking it might be through 2022 as they're kind of developing if this is going to be a permanent deal or not. So she's thrilled because her daughter's coming home from California where the fires are right now. Mm -hmm. And it's just going to be doing her own thing at her own place. Still working for Google, but doing it from her home here in, you know, in Ohio. So curious. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to shift gears and, and we were talking about this in, uh, in in our green room, and I hope you enjoyed spending some time in the green room. I know it's really nice. Uh, we worked hard <laughs> on that, uh, but but it's, it's election season, and I know you're you've got you've got some clients that you're supporting. And I'm just oh yes, just, you know, that's that's something different. You know, it's one thing to have businesses and talk business strategy, election politics that, and not really politics, but the election <laughs> process. Uh, I just. Tell us what's going on. Talk about oh my gosh. Script, right? <laughs> what is what is not going on? Oh my gosh, that would be the better question, Otis. Oh, we are 40 some days from election day. And you know, the year of 2020, you don't even know what's going on. I, you know, honestly, some days I expect to open my door and see Godzilla just passing through, <laughs> you know, the neighborhood. Um, but when you throw in an election season on top of it, it has been chaotic. It's been addictive. It's been so much fun. I know that's probably not the word that some people would use. I love it. Neck breaking speeds, constantly changing things over, but it is different. For instance, we're not doing hardly any in-person events. I mean, sure, there are some situations where there'll be some rallies where we're getting some support from, you know, that national scale, depending on the candidate I'm working with and the client I'm working with. And that's a different conversation, but the virtual concept on stuff online, the fundraisers, you know, things where we're just once again, introducing ourselves, trying to get people of our generation, Camden and my generation involved the younger people, whether it's movie nights or comedy acts or, you know, virtual scavenger hunts. I mean, you name it, I've probably <laughs> introduced the idea at some point, whether I am, a political strategist or the communications director serve different roles for different campaigns. And that's been intriguing because getting people fired up when they're just, they're tired. They're tired of what's been happening with COVID, with the fires. I mean, every single time you turn around a corner, you're scared that it's going to be somebody with more bad news. Mm -hmm. And how do you turn that into a positive? That's been a struggle, but it's also been fantastic because there are things you can absolutely borrow from and pick from. And the other thing I want to say is it's not even election day. Let's be, let's be honest. We're not dealing with, okay, you're going out to the polls in November. It's more like an election month. Okay. You've got the mail-in ballots. You've got different deadlines. Uh, lumber people I've spoken to have already made up their minds about who they're going to vote for. They've given money. So according to the traditional, if you can even call it that, the tradition, I've got to use air quotes, the traditional <laughs> election season, you know, you've usually got about another month, another four weeks or so to really hammer in there. So it's, it's crunch time. We've gone from, 
you know, registering to vote and getting information about your candidates to, okay, we got to get the vote out and make sure you are voting for us now. Mm -hmm. So um, it's been fun though. I mean, for instance, this past weekend on Saturday, I was part of a music video. There's a really famous rapper by the name of Trill. He's dropping his worldwide album here in a couple weeks. And we decided to turn this uh, music video into a campaign commercial for young professionals. So that was, that was fun. Um, you know, this coming weekend, we're doing a virtual scavenger hunt for one particular group. Another group, we're going to be playing hopscotch with the sun here starting on Saturday, where we'll be in six different states doing some work within about two days. So that's going to be really exciting. I can't wait to do that again. It's been fun in the past, so I hope it's fun now. Just remember your water and your sunscreen, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 exactly. Because when you're moving like that, Ooh, you can quickly get over overrun and forget to take care of yourself. Going back to what you said much earlier is, you know, that routine gets your routine that you normally have gets thrown out the window when you start doing those sort of things. Oh gosh. Yes. No, our schedule. I mean, even my schedule, it's like, look, I've got these things on the calendar. I've got these appointments and by about six o'clock in the morning bang goes that theory <laughs> so it's intriguing at, to you know run your business while you have the political side of things really taking off here because you got to keep your eye on the prize which is to make that community engagement that impact and create a brighter future right oh yeah oh. on the communication side of things and like you know just kind of in a broad sense on the political side you talked about how there's so much going on and so many bad things. That everyone's kind of looking for the bad news. How how have you been working to try to shift that perspective a little bit to get a little bit more forward thinking? Because I think it's something that you still can do of saying, look, here are my 10 solutions. This is how it's going to be better next year. Look at me type of thing rather than focusing on the negative side of things. Is that something you've been working on because I, with the communication with these different uh, political campaigns? Oh, goodness, yes. Tremendously so. It is something that you are facing every hour on the hour, two minutes to the hour, because I will say this, you know, somebody who's in control of the message in these places, it's really important to remember that words and actions are paramount, but words are paramount. Uh, being sincere, being believable, telling sure these things are going on, but what can we do to make things better? Absolutely. But you have to be remembering the basic concept, which is when you put words out there, they have power. So, you know, working towards a brighter future, you know, paving the way to November, leading the way to positive change and whatnot. And that's been working. And it also helps when the candidate themselves are really defined. Okay. They know who they are. They know what they want to do. They know how to get it done. Those are crucial. And when you're out there doing community engagement, you have to relay that message. It's not just putting a video on Instagram or doing something live on Facebook. I mean, those things are absolutely wonderful. The town halls, bring up the issues, knowing where you stand on the issues, definitely meat and potatoes. But, you know, we do, we have something we like to call <clears throat> political persuasiveness. And that's essentially a training that all my staffers, the volunteers, every single campaign I'm on goes through. Because it's important for you to be able to translate and have a conversation with someone. Not everybody is a networking evangelist or somebody who goes out to do speaking engagements, right? Who's perfect in their elocution and their power and projection. Uh, but it goes back to, it's not just about the facts. You start off with commonality. What do we have in common? Right, Camden, you and I could talk to each other, I think, for hours and not even break a sweat or need to take mm -hmm. a sip of water. But when you're meeting somebody off the street who's having a hard time where they're trying to find suitable child care while they're holding on to a job just to pay the bills, what do you say to them? How do you say it to them? And how are you sincere and where you're coming from. And I found that the most successful people, whether you're in politics, entrepreneurship, or a creative professional in general, it's how do you create that understanding and that basis of that relationship. It's not by throwing facts and statistics in their face. You start off with what you have in common. And at the very least, we're living individuals on this planet. 
not even just human beings. Let's, if we have to take it that far. And that's where I've been focusing a lot of my time is reflecting over what's been going on. I don't care if you're a Democrat. I don't care if you're a Republican. I don't care if you're a moderate or an independent. I do not care. That does not matter to me. What matters to me is getting you to the table where we're open-minded and at least having conversation you could start with, what's your favorite cereal? Or what did you have for breakfast today? True story, I've been there, done that. That's what I've had to do. Uh, so that's, that's what makes the difference to me. And the positivity, the mutual respect, um, the bipartisan opposition, and those conversations definitely stem from where we are at the table on that front. So one other thing that I wanted to bring up that I think would be interesting as you were talking there is what it reminds me a lot of is something, and I, for the life of me, I cannot think of the actual phrase, but uh, it's that common enemy is better than a common love, right? And please save me on what the actual phrase is on that. <laughs> Neither of y'all, did no. I butcher it that bad? <laughs> no. I think what the original one is, but it's that, you, you know, if, you, you, if we're all hating something together, it brings us together more than if we're all loving something because we can divide ourselves while we're for that love because I want to love it more than you. But if we're all hating it, we can all be all the same team. You're still not getting it? The enemy of my enemy? Is that where you're going? He's my friend. Oh, no. Yeah. The enemy of my <laughs> enemy is my friend. <laughs> well, that's not it. So maybe I just made this one up. You know, I'll, I'll, write, go. I'll write a book now. And uh, I guess I'll, that's a novel idea, yeah. apparently. I thought I was stealing from somebody. But the idea that it's more, e it's a lot easier for us to just all sit here together and be like, oh, I hate that. Oh, those darn fires, you know, yeah. oh, COVID, whatever it is. But then to get together and say, oh, well, I want this to happen. It's kind of that opposite side of the spectrum of the love side, where it's, this is the future we're trying to build, the happier side of things. And I feel like that we naturally have this aversion towards that because of that type of relationship to where we can get more competitive around love, we get jealous, we get envious about those type of things. And so when you're talking about positive change, I think you can get more things like that. And so the reason I was bringing this up before we became too much of a tangent, because I can't think of a phrase, is that- <laughs> The glass house, why, Camden. <laughs> when you talk I've... about shifting perspective, uh, especially in the political sense, I think that's why you hear at least, you know, the ads and those type of things are all in the negative perspective, because it's a lot easier to get together and say, isn't that bad? Isn't that all terrible? Well, that was all terrible, right? Well, newsflash, all 330 million of us can usually agree on the terrible things. The more, the harder things to talk about are the things we like, the things we want to change, the things that we think could be better. And, you know, I honestly lost the question <laughs> because I wound up talking well, about that phrase too much. But I think that was an interesting part of that common enemy versus the common love when you apply it to the political side of things and what you're trying to sell through your communication. Well, we have a phrase in politics we like to use, and it goes back to the glass house. So maybe this is the extension of that tangent, Camden, but we oftentimes say it's easier to throw rocks at the glass house versus build it up within. Is that mm -hmm. somewhat where you were going? Yeah, no, no, no I agree with you. That's what I was trying to say with it, and I'm sorry about that. I have no idea. No, it's okay. It say. works. I figured I it was it. just some Otisism that I heard when I was 13, and that immediately Ooh. you would jump on it, but apparently not. <laughs> Who knows? You know, I, I do throw out some strange things occasionally that sometimes make sense. Well, I, I see. I'm, I'm curious, what's next? I mean, we could say, after, you know, November 4th, because I know I know that you already got some things planned. But what what is next? Whether For it's me, after the, my after the election or whatever. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of things. Uh, so first of all, it really depends on how the clients do, right? <laughs> Keeping their eye on the prize and see if they make it to DC or not. Um, but if they do, with a couple of them, I would like to continue my work, of course, uh, with them to make sure that they get the job done and do what they want to do because they understand every single one of these guys uh, understands that Congress is not a lifetime gig. They understand that they'll be there for a limited term. Maybe they might run for one or two and then kind of step out because they do have other things happening. But for me in general, I'm working on uh, three new books. I know, ambitious during this time of quarantine, right? Uh, I've got a couple of children's books that, of course, are in play that I'm wrapping up research on. So working on the illustration bit next. So we'll see how that goes. I'm definitely taking my time because there's my pride and joy. Uh, the third one goes back to nonprofit and 
goes back to nonprofit planning and exec executive coaching style specifically for nonprofit leadership. Really simple, but can be really effective things that they just don't, and I have not seen, unfortunately, take been taken seriously into account. So, you know, same old, same old in the world of publishing, right? Uh, continuing my work with clients, helping them grow, helping them you know, go around those obstacles, help them really see what they need to be doing to be agile, flexible, and, you know, survive and thrive in this next normal, as I call it, not the new normal, the next normal, because something's always forthcoming, right, guys? Mm -hmm. And I'm doing a lot of work uh, with my professional development as well. So we've seen over the last few months, everybody convert and jump into this world of virtual programming. And they're like, Ashi, are you having a hard time with this? I said, no, I, I started doing this more than a year ago. So for me, my international trainings have been doing really well, but I'm always, always looking at what is going on in the world around us, that context to create that uh, new content. So sure, we do a lot of nonprofit content, but what I've seen to be very um, empowering and strengthening that creates a lot of disruption as in transformation as well as putting the business hat on and offering business advice to the nonprofit world, um, you know, dealing with gen intelligence, dealing with emotional intelligence, things of that sort. But I've got something really fun coming up in a couple of weeks, in about three weeks, I've got a curricula course called Get Your Life Back, a professional women's retreat. I know, exciting, right guys? Thrilling. And essentially, it is for, uh, you know, women, no matter what age you are, no matter what background you're coming from, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you are stepping out of university and expecting to do well in your first job, or if you're an empty nester going back to corporate life, right? And essentially, we are picking topics that are relevant to the professional woman. So whether it's imposter syndrome, whether it's dealing with expectations of society, the world, or yourself, or even just once again, the wellness factor of getting your life back in that self-care. And it's going to be running for five weeks. And every single week we meet on Wednesday from 6 to 7.15 Eastern Standard Time. And I bring along somebody who is an expert of a various of these various topics so every single week a new topic we have an expert who comes and gives you solutions strategies takeaways that you can go home and see how they fit into your lifestyle but at the end of the day this is about personal development as well as professional growth this is about you doing you in a safe environment in a supportive environment where you're not dealing with a jury or judge so once again that starts october 7th and if you are a woman who just wants to check it out, or if you are interested in how to get where you want to go in life, this would be for you. Yeah, is there a sign up uh, you can pass on? You oh, can tell yes. us now, and then we'll put it in the show notes also. Yeah, yes. No, I will send you a link on Eventbrite, and it is $2.99 for five weeks. But uh, because I'm on the show, I'll definitely provide a you know, keep on code here where you guys get some money off. So that'll work. Awesome. 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 Well, man, it's, it's been great. And uh, as, as uh, when Camden and I were talking about having you on the show, a wide ranging show to quote, quote uh, Joe Rogan, a, a wide ranging show. <laughs> uh, and and uh, now we're going to shift gears to uh, what'd you learn? And uh, man, you know, I don't know why I take notes because it's like, holy crap, it's, <laughs> I get writer's cramp sometimes uh, during our show because there's just so much going on. Uh, and, and for me, and maybe it's because it's a little bit of familiar, familiarity because I talked, I talked about it uh, in a leadership program I'm running yesterday, but it, is that making me time? But I, I like the fact that you even, you even coined the phrase uh, of boss time to kind of make it seem not quite so selfish because that's what a lot of <laughs> leaders do is they say exactly. me time well you know i gotta give i'm the leader I, I can't afford me time but boss time that's a different that's a different way of looking at it and i really like that so yeah that's that's what i got camden how about you 
Um, well, mostly just the shattering of the illusion of what archaeology is like. Uh, I, I'm glad I didn't go into that field. I stuck with agriculture. I was a little bit more excited <laughs> watching the plants grow, apparently. <laughs> but I think going from that is what you were talking about that you apply now, which is the patience uh, being patient and being proactive and being able to have the mix of both and balancing both of being able to be patient and wait for things to happen when you need to wait for things to happen, but also knowing when to take that step forward and being proactive on things and getting things done. Ashi, what'd you learn? I learned that your father has a better sense of humor <laughs> than I could have ever imagined, first and foremost. But I absolutely did discover the depth to which how how committed you both are to spreading good lessons, to helping empower, to help educate, to help expose the good and the bad to those who are wanting to be in the beautiful entrepreneurial space, but also those professional lessons as well. I mean, Camden, every single time you and I talk, it makes me laugh because I'm thinking, he reminds me of myself at a certain age because you just say some really silly things, but you also say some profoundly wise things, uh, which I love. So yeah. My dad always says I drop like one or two nuggets an episode, the rest you can just throw out. <laughs> <laughs> Use that strainer, right? Oh exactly. my goodness. <laughs> How can folks uh, touch base with you, Ashi, follow you, catch up with you? Okay. So you can find me on LinkedIn. You can find me across Twitter, obviously Instagram. My website is pivotalsolutionsconsulting.com. And I will make sure Otis has my email information and a phone number for you guys to be able to reach out and touch base with me. Awesome. Well, we really appreciate your time and uh, thanks for the, the great education and, and some great stories on uh, what's going on out there and how to how to handle it. Camden, why don't you run us out? Okay, thank you all again for listening to today's show. Special thanks to Ashi Mittal for joining us today and our sponsors, MASH, Military and Athletic Strength Hemp Oil, and Verbi Virtual Events. You can check out recent episodes of the Camden Otis Show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, and check out a full archive at thecaminotisshow.buzzsprout.com. The Camden Otis Show is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks again, and we'll see you all next week.